any system of farming that's dependent on outside inputs is not sustainable. It isn't going to last. And maybe you don't run out of them for a thousand years, but you are going to run out or the price is finally going to get so high that you can't afford it. And so the only system of agriculture that is going to feed human beings in perpetuity is one that is creating its fertility from the things you're doing. And that's why organic is a perpetually renewable system. And I speculate sometimes that the problem with that is that we're, if we do this right, we're not buying anything. And I don't think maniacal capitalism gets very excited about producers who don't buy anything. Yeah. And Mother Nature is providing our inputs. That yeah. makes us seriously subversive. Welcome back to The Real Organic Podcast, Episode 8. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project, a grassroots farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label that distinguishes soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock. Thank you for subscribing, and be sure to visit our website, realorganicproject.org, to become a real fan. You just heard from today's guest, Elliot Coleman, one of the most well-known organic farmers in the country. This interview between my co-director, Dave Chapman, and his old friend, author, farmer, and hippie for life, Elliot Coleman, took place on his farm on the coast of Maine. They'll speak about the failures of the USDA organic label and what we need to do about it. To ask us a question or share your thoughts about any of our podcast episodes, please call 347-ORG-FARM. Now let's return to the conversation with Real Organic Advisory Board member, Elliot Coleman. Welcome everybody. I am here today with my good friend, Elliot Coleman. We're sitting at Four Season Farm in Harborside, Maine. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. I'm fortunate to be here. Elliot always has beautiful farms. I first knew him um, up at the Mountain School in Berkshire, Vermont. And um, so here we are, Elliot. What a long, strange trip it's been. Many, many, many years later, Dave. That's yeah. right. And I remember you were farming with a team of oxen. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> when I met you, I uh, I met you at that gas station. Yeah. Uh, and I was using a team of oxen down the road. And uh, I saw you at the pump next to me, and I thought you looked familiar. And I asked if you were Elliot Coleman. So we had a lot of fun. You were a great teacher. Um, you really were. You, sh you shared of your knowledge and of your library, um, of your food. <laughs> um, I, w I would like to go back with you and look at the development of your thought uh, about organic farming, which you've been at a long time. And, hmm. you know, I know that over that time you're thinking about even what organic is has changed, although the basic understanding is there, but I know the questions that you ask have changed. So could we go back and talk about when did you first start to farm? Yeah, what inspired me, Dave, was reading Scott and Helen Nearing's book, Living the Good Life. And uh, I came over to meet them uh, in Maine. They uh, were living just down the road from where I am now. We became friends, and a couple of months later, when we decided we wanted to farm, uh, we came over to chat with them while we were hitting real estate agents, and Helen said, heck, we're not using the back half of our farm. Why don't you buy that? They sold it to me for a giveaway price because they thought it was great that somebody actually was gonna use the land. It, it was all covered with spruce fir forest and, and a lot of rocks, so it was, an adventure that I was getting into, uh, more than uh, a, a deep uh, dive into organic agriculture. It was gonna be organic because that was the way they farmed and it made sense to me. But what initially grabbed me was the adventure of, could I start on this piece of poor forest land, cut down the 
trees, roll out the rocks, create fertility, and grow all my own food, like the pioneers had done uh, hundreds of years ago. Yeah. So that was the motivation. What I realized, and this is great, about two years in uh, was, oh, okay, that's easy. <laughs> we build a little house, uh, we can cut firewood, uh, we, uh, we've got a, a garden, we dug a root cellar, we're eating out of the garden. There has to be more to this than that. And at that point, uh, uh, I started reading all of the books in Scott's library, and Scott had as good a library as I'd ever seen with books on organic agriculture. And going back to some of the earliest from the 1940s, like Lady Balfour and, uh, and uh, uh, Lymington, and, and the, the early intelligent writers who had at that time said, gee, wait a minute, agriculture seems to be going in the wrong direction, and is there another direction? And that got me thinking that what had started out as an adventure, there was a lot to this. This was more than just uh, climbing this mountain and going home. Uh, there was something here that was deeper. And the deeper became more evident when I read uh, books about the difference in uh, uh, nutritional value of uh, food from uh, good soil compared to uh, poor soil and uh, food from soil that was alive because you were putting organic matter into it rather than soil that was dead because you were just putting chemicals into it. And on and on, and it became evident that this was the only way to farm if human beings wanted to uh, be healthy and if we wanted a healthy planet. And so it started out as just an adventure, and I was an adventurer, became uh, a really serious investigation of the relationship between human beings and their use of the planet for their survival. And how best to do that so the planet isn't destroyed and so that we're getting uh, the most exceptional quality food we can possibly get. And uh, it just grew from there. Uh, uh, I read more and more books and there are some excellent ones. In fact, uh, I've put together in my office what is probably as good a, a library on the subject as exists anywhere in the world. And it's, it's really wonderful. The other day I was reading an article and at the end of the article, it listed seven books and they were all on my shelf, you know, because I wanted to check whether they really said that. And I was like, yeah, okay, good. We have the information. And the information is so good. And what all those people knew years ago, we don't know anything different now. I mean, I'm probably using some techniques that they might not have envisioned there or a, a new tool, but basically it's the same thing. And basically it's returning organic wastes to the soil. It is that simple because that's what all the microorganisms in the soil live on. And they're the ones who make everything work. And the more organic matter you put in there, the more water the soil holds and you need the water for all the processes that are going on, and you just have one thing building upon another. So that was, that was great. But the other thing that entranced me, uh, we had two inches of topsoil when we cleared this spruce fir forest, and I was just awed at how quickly we were able to create what I now define as a biologically active fertile soil with leaves from the woods, spoiled hay from a neighbor, uh, a, a little horse manure from another neighbor, seaweed from the coast, nothing that I wouldn't have been able to dig up as a peasant uh, 200 years ago. And th th these were all resources that farmers, actually intelligent farmers, had been using before the chemical industry came in and convinced them 
that rather than using all those wonderful free resources that worked with the direction the planet wanted to go, they should buy their inputs from the chemical companies. Yeah. So I'm I'm swimming with things I want to I want to mention. In fact, let me swipe a piece of paper from you because I want to jot down a note so that I yeah. I uh, that's all right. I'll just grab it. All right, is that okay? So, um, so let's let's go back for a minute to the forties, nineteen forties, and um, I think thirties and forties. It's not it's not when organic farming began, but it's when it began as a movement. Um, there have been people farming with the te same techniques that you're using here for literally four thousand years that we know of. Um, in a sustainable way. If we pay attention to F. H. King's Farmers of Forty Centuries, basically putting waste organic matter back into the soil was the, always the secret. Yes. The history, though, of what we now call organic, uh, really came out of the probably the last twenty years of the nineteenth century. And one of the most interesting is a man named Robert Elliott, who wrote a book about his farm. His farm was called Clifton Park, and it was entitled The Clifton Park System of Agriculture. And basically, he was running what a researcher today would call a, a grass-based rotation. But he had land in grass grazed by his sheep and his cattle. And after four years of that, he would till it up and grow wheat on it for a year, and then beans on it for a year, and then barley on it for a year, and then put it back into grass. Uh, what the British at the time called lay farming, or also alternate husbandry. The fields alternated between building up fertility in the grass years and exploiting it uh, during the cropping year. And I think he inspired an awful lot of people to look at agriculture differently because he, he was blatant. This was before anybody else was really complaining about chemicals, but he would say, why use these things? You're buying something that you can create by, by exploiting the direction in which nature wants to go anyway. And uh, so his book uh, inspired... Uh, uh, Sir George Stapledon, who finally wrote a book entitled Lay Farming that, that uh, uh, described the techniques. And uh, that's basically what we've been doing. So we have part of the farm and grass uh, legume pasture grazed by our chickens. And then the next year we're exploiting that built up fertility with, with crops. Yeah. So... <sighs> He might have said, why do they do it? But they certainly did do it. Uh, what we call chemical farming and is now called conventional was certainly unconventional at one time, but now it is the convention. It's become massively the norm in, certainly in, well, North America and Europe. Oh yeah, and, well, and, all over the world. And I... all over the world, it's, it's, it's moved in. Even in China, where, where we, we have a history of, of um, 4,000 years of continuous, intensive cultivation of, of food crops. Even now, it's become a chemical wasteland, and the Chinese friends I have say that people in the country are actually afraid to eat the food. It's, it's so polluted. It's so contaminated. I, I it's insist so... on calling it chemical rather than conventional okay. agriculture. I'm good with that. Uh, so, so chemical agriculture has become the norm for uh, for for our country. And what people were fooled by uh, was mainly by nitrogen. And uh, Scott Nearing uh, used to tell me he'd seen a guy do an experiment with celery. And if you pour on uh, liquid nitrogen fertilizer, uh, uh, diluted properly, he said you could see the celery plants grow. <laughs> They were just absorbing it because they love growing in a moist ground and you made that moist ground extra fertile. And so it was the, the drug effect of nitrogen that first sucked farmers in. And 
Uh, some of them may have been influenced also in the early days when uh, superphosphate became available. And it was, that was really fascinating because before they had phosphate deposits, the <laughs> phosphate companies would scour the European battlefields and collect bones yeah. and, uh, and treat them with acid to get uh, uh, superphosphate. But what uh, Robert Elliott and the other wise people were talking about was, yes, you can get that drug effect, but just like drugs, it doesn't continue. And you have blown out certain parts of your system that would otherwise be doing that naturally. Yes. You know, Jake Guest, one of my early teachers, told me a story about that when he was uh, in the Army and he was traveling back. And he, I think he was in uh, maybe the, the, the Near East, the Middle East. And he, he went to an area where um, chemical farming was relatively new. And he talked to the people there and they said, you know, they were very tricky about it. They're very smart. They, they picked the very best farmers in the valley. And they went to them and they said, we're going to give you this. We're going to give you this yeah. seed. Yep. We're going to give you this bag of fertilizer. Try it and see what happens. And of course, they were the best farmers. They already had the best yields. And their yields went up quite significantly. And everybody said, okay, we'll do that too. And he said... Three years later, the, the soil was completely burned out. It really couldn't sustain that level of production. It was, it was turbocharged, and the soil, the life was gone. Back in the 70s, because I know the benefit of going to the best farmers and getting them sucked in, uh, I suggested to a charitable foundation that was asking me to advise them on organic farming. I said, here's the, the deal. Go to any county, ag county in the country, and ask everybody, especially ask the Extension Service, who the best farmer is. It's John. So go to John and say, okay, John, here's the deal. We want you to convert this farm to organic. We will lay out the whole thing, which rotation and how you're gonna put some fields into alfalfa and then move from them on. And while you're doing that, we will subsidize your income. If you take any loss over what your average income has been, we will subsidize it for you. And at the end, uh, you will have improved your soil, but you, 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 there's been no cost to you. You can't lose. And, and I said, since John is the best farmer in the county, he, he's the best farmer because he's the best manager. And he's going to manage an organic system as well as he's been managing a chemical system. And everybody one day is going to wake him and say, my God, do you know what John is? And it's exactly that. Only I wanted to turn it back around and use it against them. Yeah. Good. So let me, let me bring up another thing because this is so confusing to people who don't come from a farming background and to some who do come from a farming background. In a conversation that I had with Alan Savory recently, um, he said, you know, using farming, organic farming, many civilizations have collapsed. And um, he used it as an example that organic farming alone isn't the answer. And I said, yeah, because they weren't very good organic farmers. Organic farming is not the absence of chemicals. It, it, it grew as a movement in response to the ever increased use of, of chemicals in agriculture, but is actually much more to it than that. And I said, if you, I, I said to him, what about China? I said, you know, there are other, other civilizations. I just name it as the most, the, the most large scale example that we know of, that we have a very clear written record of. And I said, 4,000 years, you know, they fed a very high population level. So could you speak about why organic farming is not just not using the chemical nitrogen yeah. or, the, or the chemical pesticide. Uh, I have written about this, that uh, uh, the press defines organic by what it doesn't do, because that seems unique. And it is unique if everybody else is doing it, someone who isn't doing it is, is newsworthy. 
But my definition is what you're after is to create a biologically active fertile soil. Very simply, but I'm defining it by what you do, your positive actions towards something, rather than your negative uh, reaction uh, against uh, uh, bad practices. And that's simply, uh, that's simply what it is. You're working with the way nature wants to go anyway and creating a soil that will look after itself. That's what we, that's what we have here. I mean, and if you, you know, you've seen the two inches of uh, poor topsoil we started with, th this is amazing. And this started with, as I said, me bringing in some autumn leaf or leaf mold and, and a few things, and all of a sudden the very first year, we had this garden. And th that's the part. And it isn't just that you had a garden, Elliot. You, you have food that is truly bursting with vitality. I mean, it's delicious. Yes. I'm just speaking as, a, as somebody who has yeah. eaten your food a number of years. It's delicious. It's, it's obviously um, attractive. So I think that uh, there is such a thing as organic by default of people who just will say, I'm not using that. And they end up with a product that is not so great, not so great, but to me, okay, that's great. That's the beginning. And, and, and for consumers, that's right. They don't want to eat poison. I, I applaud that. But there's so much more there than just a lack of poison. Yeah. Well, the fact that for many people in the U.S., organic began as gardening. And that has confused everybody because the organic gardener is the one who is going and buying soybean meal uh, or, or buying bone meal because Rodale's Organic Gardening Magazine, which we all read and was inspirational, that was its suggestions. And these were gardening suggestions because no farmer can afford soybean meal and bone meal and those things. And so the idea never got through to the public that what the organic farmer was doing as opposed to the organic gardener was operating on a totally different uh, mm. basis. Uh, that he wasn't depending on inputs, but yeah, you know the, the, the two words, uh, endogenous and exogenous. Endogenous means it's coming from inside and exogenous means it's coming from outside. And real organic farming is an endogenous system because you're growing the waste organic matter that's going back into the soil that's continuing to, to make the system uh, fertile forever and ever. And any uh, uh, system of farming and, and uh, a number of people, Fred Kirschman especially, agrees with me on this. Any system of farming that's dependent on outside inputs is not sustainable. It isn't going to last. And maybe you don't run out of them for a thousand years, but you are going to run out or the price is finally going to get so hard, high that you can't afford it. And so the only system of agriculture that is going to feed human beings in perpetuity is one that is creating its fertility from the things you're doing. And so, you know, behind you there is a field with the turnips and beets and uh, the beet leaves, uh, if we're harvesting the roots to put in the cellar, are gonna go back into the, the soil there. And they're gonna be part of next year. I mean, I'm already fertilizing for next year. Yeah. And I'm merely growing this year's crops. And that's why organic is a perpetually renewable system. And I speculate sometime that the problem with that is that we're, if we do this right, we're not buying anything. <laughs> and I don't think maniacal capitalism gets very excited about producers who don't buy anything. Yeah. And Mother Nature is providing our inputs. That yeah. makes us seriously subversive. So uh, let's talk about being subversive. Um, I, I feel 
like when we began, uh, and the organic movement began before I was born, and organic farming began before America was born. I mean, it, it, you know, it's been going on for a long time. But um, w when I became an organic farmer and met you at that gas station and was farming with my oxen, and, you know, you became a great advisor. I didn't consider what I was doing to be uh, creating a, a movement of protest. I considered it to be creating an alternative. Okay, to, fair to enough. To an existing system. Yep. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very adversarial. I wasn't, I wasn't um, out there um, giving angry speeches about why people should eat organic food. I was so thrilled to be able to do something that I loved to do, that I believed in, and that I felt was good for other people. Yes. And as we went along and we tried to figure out how to make a living and we did all this and raise a family and the things that we all do, and then I got into this situation about seven years ago where we were encountering a political problem with organic. And... We, we worked on reform, and we'll talk about that. And, and ultimately, you know, we really were trying to reform, which did involve protesting what was happening. I, I actually feel like right now we're moving beyond protest back to creating an alternative. But uh, so let, what, what's your thoughts about, about protest? And what's your thoughts about um, the implications, because as you say, there are very strong political implications to farming this way. And, and I, yeah. I, I, I've come to see them yeah. so much in the last seven years. But let me hear what you have to say. Well, I've always thought science should be inquiry. And when I got into organic farming, I found that agricultural science was not inquiry. It was dogma. And there was an accepted, uh, almost a religion uh, that had been taught at all the universities. Every uh, extension agent had bought into it. Uh, everybody I ran into uh, at universities had bought into this. And they were wrong. And so it becomes a little bit of a, a headbutt when... You're dealing with scientists who refuse to even begin to consider that what they're teaching is not the, uh, God's truth, which is what they have come to believe it is. And, uh, you know, if you know, I'd been to college, <laughs> I had a good education, I knew how science was proposed to proceed, and it was antagonizing to these people when I explained to them that what they were doing was not science. Yeah. It was a, a deviation of horticulture using drugs rather than what uh, the systems that they could be using. And it wasn't that what they were saying that chemicals would do was wrong. It was what they were saying that what I was doing was wrong, uh, and it wasn't wrong. And, and the fact that you could never get them to come out to the farm and see, it works. That, I mean, after a while, you really wondered about the, the flaw in education that let people buy into a mistaken concept so thoroughly. So I'd like to go back to that, but just to say, when, when you began um, as a farmer, Elliot, uh, it, it was a, a radical thing to be an organic farmer. It, in terms of cultural terms, there was not respect. There was no market. Um, the, so much that, that we really take for granted now, including uh, scientists who are, are, are actually very friendly to yeah. what we're doing back yeah. then, I remember talking to uh, uh, Bill Liebhart, who was, I think, perhaps the first scientist at Rodale, and he came from the academy. He, I think, yep. it was at University of Maryland, and he said, 
yeah, when I took that job, people literally stopped talking to me. Yep. They, they would look the other way when they walked by me yep. in the hallway. These are people who had been my friends yep. because they saw me as betraying science. Yeah. I thought, wow. And he said, yeah, we can almost not imagine now, but it was hard back then. It was hard to leave that world and, oh. and, and come oh, for to... them, yeah. I mean, for that, us who'd never been in it. Uh, you know, I had uh, a guide like Scott Nering who'd been doing this for 40 years, and all I had to do was walk into his garden, and holy cow, this is, this is working. Uh, and so that was easy. And then we did have occasional academics, uh, Stuart Hill being one. Stuart Hill was one of the first really brave uh, professors That's from right. a, a major university uh, to uh, look at this and, and uh, uh, read some of the books we were reading and come to the conclusion that we were on the right track. I asked Stuart about that. I said, how did you do that? Did you get a whole lot of, a, a lot of grief? And he said, I just did better research and published more papers than everyone else. Yeah. He said it was the only way yeah. to not be an outcast yep. is I just published so many papers. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, but he was great. Right? Your story about Liebhardt, that I've talked to farmers in the Midwest who transited into organic farming, and they'd go into the, uh, the coffee shop in the morning, and the other farmers wouldn't talk to them yeah. because somehow they were uh, undermining the truth. Yeah. And so what is it that's so threatening about that? <laughs> and people finding out that they've been wrong, I think is the, the hard thing. Uh, uh, in an article I read years ago, uh, a woman named Lola Smith was writing about pesticides. And she was writing about the difficulty of there, if there is some professor at a university He's now in his 60s, close to retirement, and he has devoted his whole professional career to developing pesticides and encouraging the use of pesticides. And for him to encounter me, what's he going to admit? That his whole life was wrong? Oh no, he is going to fight tooth and nail to tell me that I'm ridiculous. Yes. Uh, you were up against people who had uh, devoted themselves to what was turning out to be a, an untruth. And that's a very hard thing. And that continues. That yes. continues. But um, it, it feels to me that the, the edges are, are fraying. And um, there's a different conversation going on, but I don't know. I'm confused because I see two things happening. One is this almost subterranean local, that's a nice word, subterranean, local economy of farmers markets and CSAs and uh, really, uh, you know, uh, urban urban uh, farms that, that people are getting much closer to uh, yeah. the people who are providing them with food and are asking different questions. And at the same time, I see a thing in the supermarkets, which is where I sell most of what I grow, where fewer and fewer multinational corporations are owning more and more of the stores. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Just in the time I've been doing this, and two of the major people that I sold to, two of the major chains, are now owned by adult Dutch multinational. And they own a third one yeah. down in, yeah. in Pennsylvania. So yeah. these are yeah. these the yeah. diversity in the marketplace is gone. And the suppliers, as Alan Lewis said last year, really for organic, we're down to about two major suppliers for the whole country. Right. But that's for industrial organic. We see none of that because we sell to a local clientele. We actually have a rule where we don't go more than 25 miles from the farm because we like the idea of feeding our neighbors. And uh, so we, the idea that people are limited to, <laughs> to basically two wholesalers, it, the customers who come here to the farm stand 
every week. They come here because they've tasted the food. They wouldn't go near the supermarket because they know it isn't the same thing. And, you know, I haven't preached to any of them. Uh, they've just tasted it, I think, uh, or, uh, you know, it, the tenderness or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, everything about it is, is better. <laughs> Obviously, the environmental impact of your farm is positive rather than negative. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's see fields. Yeah. It, it looks like a, 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 a professionally done quilt with these different uh, colors here and there. I tell people that uh, I have no artistic ability at all, but in agriculture, every spring, I get to start with this large brown canvas <laughs> and decorate it in different <laughs> shades of green. And that's basically what's going on. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, and if, if as an organic farmer, I had to struggle and, and uh, uh, go to great lengths to make things work, you know, I might have a different attitude toward it, but I don't. It works. It's just amazing how well this works, even from the start, if you're paying attention to uh, what makes the soil tick and, and how to uh, make that go on. Yeah. You know, and a lot of this, it's really interesting to me what's going on with the big farms nowadays. So you have Gabe Brown out there changing the way an awful lot of farmers uh, uh, operate. Yeah. Not by telling them chemicals are bad, but by showing them how cover crops and green manures and, and crop rotations actually work. And it just fascinates me because these have been part of agriculture for 4,000 years. And they were definitely part of uh, conservation agriculture that uh, uh, came out of the 30s and uh, all the work that uh, uh, the land people were doing and Louis Bromfield and all of them. But they finally managed to penetrate into the headspace of the big time producers. And these are the same techniques we're using. Yeah. And the fact that they aren't, what should we say, perfectionists about it, they'll still use a little herbicide here and there. Uh, I think that's, they're gonna even eventually realize that's not necessary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that has been, to me, the most fascinating uh, change because all of a sudden, we're not afraid of biology. And biology is what runs the natural world. And, uh, you know, for years, agriculture was, was bio-averse. Nobody wanted to even say that there were microorganisms in the soil because you were afraid they were going to eat your carrot or something. But now everybody is celebrating the fact, yeah. you know, and the soil microbiome and then the human microbiome. I mean, come on, this is, this is a total change uh, yeah. where we are uh, 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 celebrating the fact that uh, we share the earth with these million and million and billion uh, little organisms. Our friend, uh, mutual friend Will Brinton has said that Basically, the last 80 years of soil science and human nutrition have almost entirely supported the observations of Albert and Louise Howard. Yeah. And yeah. that they do have uh, a more uh, uh, elaborate explanation for why things work. We're learning more about the soil microbiome and the human microbiome. But, but they actually say, yeah, this was right. Yeah, it's a that's a beautiful thing, but at the same the time, reason, even though it was right, it was going against a major industrial and a major money making system, and boy, when you're up against that level of uh, of power, it it makes it a very difficult battle to win, and uh, you know. Chemical agriculture has had the ability 
uh, to uh, get more propaganda out there. I remember back when I started, they were running trials where they had uh, uh, Nature's Acre and Organic Acre uh, fields side by side out in the Midwest. And, uh, or, you know, excuse me, nature's acre for the organic and, and chemical acre or conventional acre. And on that, they did everything uh, and used every chemical and every pesticide. And over here, they did nothing, just nothing. You know, maybe spread a little manure. And, it, well, it was so blatantly uh, uh, prejudiced. And yet they were presenting that as if this is proving something. I mean, you ran into enough of those things and you lost faith almost 100% in what was passing at the time for agricultural science. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that most civilians just don't understand the enormity of the industrial complex that we're dealing with yeah. here. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, I, I loved that, I didn't love it, but it was so interesting when Shelley Pingree spoke at the Thetford rally and she said that the food industry spends, I think, $330 million a year lobbying to change the minds of people in Congress. And she said, remember that that's more than the defense industry spends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To give you a sense of what we're up against. Well, the fact, Dave, that even though I think from everything I've read and books in my library and books all over the place, that the quality of food and people's diet is the key to human health and happiness. It's, this seems so undeniable, and yet the government still allows junk food to be created and sold everywhere and uh, uh, people's, people are, are destroying their health with uh, foods that the government refuses to condemn. And it's so easy to condemn them because they're filled with sugar and they've been uh, processed the fact that they have no nutrition left so you can make the bread blow up fatter looking or something. Come on, this is just... yeah. And, and it, it changes, uh, people get used to whatever they get used to. It changes the economy. Something that uh, I was talking with Mark Schatzker earlier this week, a uh, wonderful interview, and he said that uh, a five-pound chicken back in 1948, I think, cost about $4. And he said today, well, in, in last time he counted was about 2015, that chicken would cost about $7. And he said in counting for inflation, that $4 would now be $30. Yeah, yeah. So, which is why your organic chicken is about $30, because you're exactly. actually having to do it right. And, and because you can get a $7 chicken, people are outraged. It's like, oh, you're growing food for the rich when you want a $30 chicken, who can afford that? Well, everybody afforded that in 1948. That's what a chicken cost. Yeah. And I, I really think that we lose track of that. We lose track of what food is worth because it's so undervalued because it's actually worth much less. Yeah. Yeah. Complicated. Before we go a little bit more into, into protest, let, let's talk about climate. Um, that is something I think is relatively new in the organic conversation. I don't think Albert Howard or Louise Howard were thinking about the impact of agriculture on climate back in 1940. What do you think about it now? Is that something that you have awareness of? Oh, yes. Um, I think uh, the attention that was put on cattle was mistaken. Uh, because as I tell people, you know, I have a nice pasture out behind the house. If I have a steer eating that grass and fattening up and I butcher that steer, I'm not responsible for any additional CO2 because the steer is just recycling what the grass took out of the air. And uh, the fact that uh, 
uh, uh, cattle were being just uh, uh, shamed and blamed for all of that, I found uh, really poor thinking. It's the, uh, the, the feedlot mentality that was responsible, where you're growing grain in, in Iowa and shipping it to uh, Idaho. Uh, and in Idaho, you have a huge pile of manure there's no use for. I mean, th this is what's destroying the, the world. Yeah. Um, the only time I think about what this farm is contributing is when I put diesel in my tractor. I am participating in that. Uh, what allows me to not feel bad about it is that I know that I could get a horse and be using it for the same soil preparation that the, the tractor is doing. Uh, because I thoroughly believe that organic matter helps make soil more fertile if it's mixed into the top three or four inches. And so that's exactly what I do with the waste organic matter. Uh, other than that, um, well, we cleared this from the forest. So I did cut down all those trees. And uh, some of them we, we sold, they became pulp. Uh, others we burned for firewood and others we just burned to get rid of it. So I guess that is a contribution, but since then it's been growing grass and, and plants and making a contribution to human survival. Before I got here, was making a contribution to red squirrel survival. <laughs> they were the unhappiest people here because I unhoused them. But uh, I can say, having just walked around the farm, I saw almost no bare soil. And um, so you are managing the land very carefully. You are keeping something growing all the time. The, the land is green. Well, and, it makes you know, sense. Of course it does. Yeah. Yeah. But it requires skillful management to achieve. Right. We are actually investigating using fewer and fewer different green manures to see if we can get our green manures down to ones that we can easily save the seed from. And, uh, you know, whether I let the, the, the buckwheat grow until it's almost mature, mow it with my sigh, you know, beat the seeds out, and that's my seeds next year. So I don't even have to bring that in. Uh, and rye is the easiest because it's so easy to save seed from rye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we're, I won't say maniacal, but we're fascinated by doing everything as perfectly as we can. And so we're, we're looking at things I'm quite sure most farmers would totally ignore what's wrong with bringing in green manure seeds, but I'm just curious about how self-contained we can be. Um, I would like to have an electric tractor, but then I'm not convinced that all the energy that goes into solar panels or into a windmill, it's ever truly recovered uh, by the power that's made by that thing. And if worse came to worse, I still have my spade and my fork, and we could still eat very well yeah. with handwork. In fact, very often I've designed a small cultivating tractors and stuff and looked at the ones that are, are, are being made and decided against it because basically the handwork we're doing is, is perfectly adequate and it's pleasant work to do. So I wanted to make something that would allow us to put transplants in. But uh, I got thinking about it, I was like, no, uh, that may cut the time in half, but that's actually pleasant time. <laughs> you know, you're making a hole, tucking these little guys in. Uh, so in a way, uh, yeah, we tend to celebrate the joys of, of human hand work on the farm. Yeah, yeah.
I think there's a few places I might want to go back, but let's let's step up to um, the last seven years. So about seven years ago, I discovered a lot of hydroponic tomatoes getting sold with an organic seal. You were the one who who uh, alerted us all to that. None of us had any idea that these guys had snuck in. In fact, I remember back about that time, someone asking me about hydroponics, and I said, oh, organic hydroponics. Said, well, that's ridiculous. There's no way those guys could qualify. And here they had qualified by bribing the USDA, basically buying their way in. I, I interviewed a number of soil scientists about it. One of them was Bill Liebhardt, and he was great. I said, well, Bill, why wouldn't that be organic? And he was just sputtering. He said, well, it just couldn't be. And it, it, it was it was very yeah. funny. But, but I've gotten a lot of very eloquent uh, explanations for that, um, an eloquence that I didn't have. Uh, people who knew a lot and, and had really great explanations, and it all made sense to me. But, 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 but Dave, Dave, just from the point of view of sustainability alone, I put a seed in this soil. All I need is the seed. My God, you, you need uh, pumps and, and filters and, and specially made solutions and, uh, and floating uh, this is a good night. The idea that that is, makes any connection at all to sustainability. And those guys are even using the word sustainable. That's the They're not other. just using it, they're claiming it yeah. as that they are more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, it, it's quite it's quite impressive example of greenwashing. You know the, the walls of lettuce like plenty? The aeroponic aeroponics, yeah. which are yeah. very popular for urban farms going to save us. If the power goes out in those the plants all die within 15 minutes, <laughs> dead, morte, <laughs> all right? It's great. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, they, they can't function for 15 minutes without, yeah. without full electrical grid. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's just crazy talk. It's just people, but that, that is the challenge of what we face, which is, I look at the regenerative movement, which is great. You know, there are a lot of great people who are like Gabe, who are Gabe Brown, who is trying to uh, say, look at this great way of farming. And as you say, it's pretty much organic, but it is great. And if they want to call it regenerative, great. But, but I just read yesterday that Dannon yogurt has embraced regenerative, right? Uh, General Mills has sworn they're taking a million acres regenerative. That's a million acres of glyphosate. Yep. yep. Right. Yep. So yep. It, it's an undefined word that means whatever the marketing person wants it to mean. It's going to be even easier for them to take over than it was for them to take over organic. So I, I think that this issue is is a real one because, as you said, it is important. Organic farming is something that's actually important. People are so disconnected from food and what they're eating and what it tastes like. And that's a problem. The unintended consequences are so profound. The health consequences, the climate consequences, the social consequences. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're being colonized. Yeah. yeah. You know, I really think that's true. Yeah. yeah. And I, we don't even have to say that these are evil people. They're just, they're just capitalists. They're trying to make a buck. But um, it's, it's the smart thing to do is to take, take a label if you can, and they can. So when we discovered seven years ago that, that um, hydroponic stuff was being certified, and I thought, and I talked with Davy, Davy Miskell, we thought, well, this got resolved in 2010 the National Organic Standards Board said, no, hydroponic cannot be organic. And we thought it was finally resolved and over. There'd never been much hydroponic being certified, but good, let's be done with that. All of a sudden, there's a great deal being certified. And so that was the beginning of keep the soil inorganic, which, which ultimately grew into the Real Organic Project. And we had our first rally 
Uh, and so it, we did become a protest movement um, at, at Stowe, Vermont, at, at a National Organic Standards Board meeting, the USDA Advisory Board meeting. And you came to that rally. Could you describe that? Well, I loved it, Dave, because the podium for the speakers was a pile of compost that uh, a neighboring farmer had brought in in his bucket and put there. So we had all the, 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 the things that should attract the press, and it did. I mean, we, uh, we were uh, able to do a march down the highway with the tractors and everything. The thing I loved is an old 60s hippie. The police were there <laughs> holding up traffic <laughs> rather than arresting us for, for doing bad things. Yeah, yeah, they were very supportive. Yeah, that was neat. And uh, uh, we did get support from most of the uh, 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 National Organic Standards Board, uh, but it was obvious that there were members of that that were uh, that had been put on there specifically to undermine uh, the the truth. But that was that was a, a fun rally, and uh, it led to all the other rallies. Yes, it did. And it, I forget if it got any national any oh, national uh, in Stowe. Uh, yeah. I think we were just a step ahead of ourselves I, no, there. No, I think we did get uh, an Associated Press article oh, okay. from it. And that, of course, okay. went, went, went far and wide. So I think we did. Yeah. It, it was small. There were only 50 farmers there. Yeah. And uh, I, it was, I mean, it was pretty fun, wasn't it? But, oh, it was great. But you created that out of nothing. I mean... I didn't create it. Uh, Pete Johnson thought of it two days before it happened. Oh, no kidding. And we said, good idea, Pete. Let's call some farmers. And we did. And I happened to have some signs and T-shirts. And so we brought those. And, and, and I remember we I drove over the minute I heard about it. I said, yeah, I want to be part of this. That's right. Yeah. You did. Jim Gerritsen drove over. Yeah. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was a really kind of joyous event. And... You know, we almost won that day. Uh, amazingly, the the Organic Trade Association met with me at that meeting and said, okay, let's fix this. And I think they meant it. But they didn't know that Driscoll's was hydroponic. And that is, uh, you know, I, that was the game changer. They're, they're 70% of the organic berries in America is Driscoll's. And they're also the majority of conventional chemical berries. So they have a huge shadow that they cast. And I think that's, that's why we lost. That's well, why we once, lost to the USDA. Once the trade association figured out that the people who were paying their salaries were actually on the wrong side, boy, did they uh, uh, shut up. Yeah. About that quickly. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, they're lobbyists. That's what they're paid yeah. to do. They're, they're, yeah. they're paid to lobby for their, their clients. Uh, it's not personal, but, but. Well, it, it, but you know, the whole thing, we, we were so good that day and yet I was aware the whole time. And I think other people were that we didn't stand a chance. Uh, well, if it hadn't been for Driscoll's, I think we did stand yeah, a chance, but, uh, but, uh, uh but we didn't, but we didn't know it because nobody knew. OTA didn't know, I didn't, nobody knew the Driscoll. I didn't find that out for half a year. Wow. And when I was on the USDA task force and three weeks before the end of six months of work, we got a case study from Driscoll's. And I was asking the woman who presented the case study how many acres? And I kept going, you know, 50? M no more. And, you know, 100? No more. 500? More. <laughs> a thousand acres of hydroponic? More. And I would say, Elliot, like an idiot, I stopped asking because I was, I was so stunned. We didn't have any idea yeah. that berries were even part of the mix. We thought it was all tomatoes. And, and then finding 
that raspberries, blueberries, blackberries are part of the mix. I, I can see strawberries being in there, yeah. but those, my God. And, and of course now peppers and, and lots yeah. of greens and, yeah. and on, on, on a scale that the, their own lobbyists, the hydro lobbyists said it was over a billion dollars in sales. And he said that in two articles, uh, that, that's a huge, huge number. So I just want to, but just, so the question is, have we ever learned when that exactly began? Uh, I remember somebody telling me that uh, the guys in Oregon, Tilth, were the first people to certify uh, a hydro operation. Well, Tilth and, and CCOF were doing it quite early, but, you know, as one inspector said, we would go and inspect a greenhouse and they're growing tomatoes in the soil. And we went the next year and there were these huge bags of compost and they're growing the tomatoes in the huge bags. And then we went the next year and the bags got smaller and smaller <laughs> and smaller. It just, it, it yeah. was really, it wasn't that they walked out and suddenly certified, you know, 40 acre um, wholesome harvest operation. It was very, Casual. I, I did ask the person who presented the, the case study about Driscoll's, and she knew all about it. And I said, were they doing this in 2010 when the, when the recommendation was made? And she went, no, it's more recent. It's the last, last two or three years. Hmm. So it was very recent, but it was very profitable. And they, they discovered they could make a lot more money doing it hydroponically. And and that 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 is why we lost that fight in, in the in the regulations, but the next year we had another rally much bigger, and and um, Senator Leahy spoke. Well, you you spoke, so yep. tell me about that. What was that like? Well, that was wonderful. Mainly, I got to see all my old buddies in Vermont because Jake spoke, and uh, yeah, I even drove Shelley over to that because she was here in Maine. Uh, uh, we. We flexed our muscle, but it turned out that it didn't make the damnedest bit of difference. And I mean, when we had Leahy on our side, fully on our side, speaking at this conference, and he was the original one behind getting the organic standards done, and he wrote the USDA and they just ignored him. He wrote the USDA a letter um, calling on Vilsack to implement a moratorium on any new certification until we could work this out. And Vilsack refused. And three weeks after Senator Leahy sent that letter, the Coalition for Sustainable Organics was formed. <laughs> because we were making progress. And yeah, you know, they, they realized them a bit. they were in trouble. They got yeah. scared. And so they started to really pump some lobbying money into the effort. So I, I, I won't say that we lost. We'll, we'll talk about that. So, so there were a number of rallies the next year. I think something like 17 rallies across the country, some big, some little. You spoke in Vermont again at uh, the Burlington rally. Yeah. You, you did a lot of traveling for the cause, yep. Elliot. Yep. Yeah. That was fun. We had the conga line drumming yeah. leading the rally, yeah. <laughs> leading the march. And, um, and we ultimately ended up in Florida. So could you talk about Jacksonville? Because you went down to that too. Yeah, well, uh, it was our uh, almost last chance because there was a, a vote that was going to be uh, held. And uh, I thought all of the people on our side spoke eloquently, and yet I, the the scales had been tipped against us by putting uh, enough bad guys on the NOSB that there was it didn't make any difference how eloquent we elegant we were because the the it was stacked against us. And that was so completely frustrating. And uh, I was surprised 
by the people I ran into there, people who I thought would have been on the, uh, the right side of this, because uh, uh, you were handing out these Protect Organic t-shirts. And I had one on, and I went and modified it. I got the uh, desk clerk to give me an envelope, and I wrote on it, from the OTA, and I taped it on under there, Protect Organic from the OTA. And people who I would have thought were interested in protecting organic came up and got really mad at me for suggesting that the OTA was on the wrong side of this. And I, you know, I, I'm pretty confrontational. I said, you've really lost it, haven't you? What are you, they, you when did you get bought out? You know, when, when did you decide you're gonna uh, trade your integrity for the almighty dollar? I wasn't nice to any of these people, but it was surprising how many of the old timers, not old time farmers, old time bureaucrats uh, were uh, uh, totally into uh, the organic being taken over by hydroponics. Yeah. So I think, I think that the issue that I see, and it's, it's an important thing to talk about, is there is the organic movement and the is, there is the organic industry. And um, the movement has wanted to build up a brand. It's wanted more people to buy organic, has wanted organic farming to expand, and in that, we are completely in alignment with the organic industry, the organic trade, the processors and, and uh, the stores and, uh, you know, the retailers. Right. That we all agree we want that to, to happen. We want to see more organic farming and we want to see, um, you know, more people choosing to buy organic. But I think the division has come that the trade doesn't want anybody in the family to criticize yeah. what's going on. And, and until fairly recently, a great many organic farmers agreed with that. They, they, they said, you know, we have problems. We gotta, we gotta clean this up. We've gotta fight for reform and we are fighting for reform. And a lot of, a lot of the NGOs the, who, who support organic were really, they were fighting for reform. I had no idea, but they were. They go to all these meetings. Yeah. But that was when that, we came to that question, is should we speak up and talk about what's happening or should we remain silent? And clearly the farmers, many of the farmers have said we can't remain silent. And now many of the, many of the, Organic advocates, you know, the bureaucrats, the people who work for for nonprofits, also are saying, you know what, it it's reached a point we can't remain silent. What we got though was we got more food on the shelves certified as organic, but we didn't get more organic farming, uh, and. The thing that has always motivated me is the way we farm. I don't look at it as a way of producing food. I look at it as the way if we're going to feed mankind into, into the future. And these supposed organic, these, these copyists who are cashing in on the value that the old hippies created with their integrity, and really did. The old hippies created this integrity. People came to believe that they, and the customers aren't getting that now. And the development isn't proceeding at the rate it would proceed if this fake stuff wasn't there, uh, you know, sucking up all the business. If in order to have all these organic strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, you had to be doing it right. We would be learning more every minute about how to do it right, and, and which is what we should be learning. I mean, 
after 55 years, I'm still learning how to do it right because I'm interested in meticulously improving everything we do. But, yeah, I mean, if you get me off on what real organic is, uh, you know, I'm weird enough to think real organic is a no-input system is this truly uh, endogenous agriculture I'm, I'm talking about. And so, uh, you know, all these people buying uh, 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 semi-truckloads of uh, uh, industrial compost from God knows what sources, I haven't vocally condemned them, but I don't look upon that as any more organic than uh, than bringing in uh, uh, inputs to any any other thing. Uh, so that's another huge conversation that I I'd probably say for another podcast because it is it, it's, yeah. an, it's an important conversation. Um, but I think that. Um, but well, just let, let me finish yeah. up. It's going to be a better conversation if I live for another 10 years because I will be able to tell you how we have been able to make this farm totally free from any inputs through better understanding of, of green manures and how they f fit into uh, crop rotations and which green manure precedes which crop. And there is so much to be learned there from the point of view I, on a uh, grain farm, there's not much to be learned because you're only growing one crop where grain and beans alternating. But we grow 55 different vegetables. <laughs> Boy, there's a lot to be learned here. One, one thing that you said a minute earlier that I would disagree with is that there isn't more organic farming. I think there is more organic farming. I think it's continuing to expand. There are a lot of young people getting into it. And, and from that perspective, I would say the National Organic Program hasn't been an unvarnished disaster. It has brought money into supporting organic and developing, helping to develop markets. The markets mostly develop themselves because people want an alternative to the chemical agriculture. I believe that's true. But, but I'm going to correct you again. Okay, good. There are more organic farmers but there isn't orga more organic farming if we look at acreage because the acreage is all in the guys who are using very suspicious, soluble uh, uh, inputs on uh, millions of acres in, in California. Yes, the numbers of organic farmers, all usually on a small scale like we are, are growing, but the acreage, I think the acreage has been taken over by the, the faux organic well, and of course, we're losing organic acreage now as the organic dairies go out. Yeah. And that, you know, so that, to me, the loss of the organic dairy farms, and they're, they're dying like flies now. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of that chicken that ought to cost $30. And that in 1948, people were willing to pay that much for that chicken. Yep. And if you say, well, yeah, but you can get a chicken that's certified organic for $7, then it looks kind of outrageous to charge what that chicken actually is worth. Yeah. And I think that when we see the big CAFOs coming in and flooding the market with cheap milk, and if over half of the milk is coming from CAFOs, and people say, well, it's not the CAFOs, it's almond milk. I say, no. If you <laughs> eliminate yeah. that CAFO milk from the market, the price goes up, yeah. and the number of real organic farmers will expand yeah. fairly dramatically, fairly quickly. Those guys in Maine milk house they are cooking boy they these guys fight they actually have ads on the radio I mean I'm impressed uh, th this is a smart couple over there Andy and Caitlin are fantastic yeah they're real they're yeah. real stars I but, agree I mean that's what any business has to do when the world is creating uh, difficulties for you to continue like uh, has been created for the organic dairies you have to just double down and, and work harder and get smarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that we that we have to do that we didn't have to do at first is is to f fight about the word organic. And and I'll say that many people say, oh, 
let's just leave it. We'll call it, we'll call ourselves agroecological or some kind of regenerative. And you know, it, I, I, I use this analogy. It's as if we build a swing set in the playground with our own hands. And then some bully named Mo comes along and knocks us off the swing set and says, I'm going to take it now. And yes, we can go and build another swing set somewhere else. But damn it, we built that swing yeah. set. Oh yeah, no, right? I agree. And, and, and I'm willing to say no, no, because, because it's important. It, it is important what we do. It, we do sell, food is medicine and we sell good medicine, Yes. right? And, and agriculture does affect climate and we help the climate. Yes. So I think it's worth fighting for because we have built a huge market and, and, and people are right to say, I want to have an alternative to that chemical agriculture. It's just, it's, it's our job to make sure they get what it is that they hope for. Yeah, well, that's why the sign at the end of our driveway says real organic and it says guaranteed real organic. And the black helicopters haven't arrived yet, Dave. So <laughs> thus far, uh, I haven't hauled you to jail yet. I'm getting away with it. Yeah. No, I'm just as belligerent as anybody on that. Uh, uh, the the old hippies created that that word, and uh, in, even before there was such a thing as hippies, wonderful people who I am old enough to be fortunate to have met back in the 70s, like uh, Lady Eve and, and the other uh, real pioneers. Um, yeah, no, we're just, uh, um, we're continuing to defend uh, the efforts that they made. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's worth it. But the, despite all of that, I get to look every day at the fact that it works. It really works. I mean, they, 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 we're talking mind blowing. You walk out here, and I can uh, find uh, some article. Not as many now, but there used to be a lot about how organic is foolish and and, and will never feed the world. Well, dang, again, we're feeding the world, or at least our little part of it here. Well, our challenge, the reason, one of the reasons we don't see those articles, Elliot, is that the major companies of conventional agriculture are also the major yeah. companies <laughs> of certified organic agriculture. Yeah. They're yeah. the same. General Mills yeah. is the big gun in both. Yeah. Driscoll's is the big yeah. gun in both. And uh, so uh, tell me, do you think that the Real Organic Project is important? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think the just the fact that we didn't roll over and uh, and give up uh, when that happened. And even though I don't think we have a snowball's chance in hell of prevailing, uh, just the fact that we are here uh, raising hell is uh, is what's incredibly important. Uh, I, I I once said to you. Uh, something about being a leader, and you said, "Hell, I'm not a leader. I'm just a nose thumber." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, to, it, to me, though, it's nice to know that there are still places like this farm that are continuing to investigate ways to grow better and better food, healthier and healthier food, uh, food. We use no pesticides. You know, there's an occasional bug, but nothing that would ever maybe want to spray, even if I did want to spray. And just the fact that we are demonstrating on a daily basis that that level of agriculture works, it makes it a lot harder for the nozzle heads to de defend what they're doing. Because, wait a minute, why are you using pesticides when... People are showing that they're absolutely unnecessary. Uh, and of all the things in our world, and I, I wrote about this. I said, you know, back when I started, we didn't know anything. And, uh, you know, Rachel Carson was getting hammered by the bad guys for what she'd said. But I said, what 
I became aware of was that before DDT, the leading pesticide was a combination of lead and arsenic called lead arsenate. Now, what species is stupid enough to have countenanced spreading lead and arsenic on people's food? And when you think about it that way, you say, my God, somebody really sold the world on the fear of insects to the point that they would allow something like that to happen. And so, you know, long before uh, uh, I was aware of anything, I was born in 38, that was on all the food I grew up in. That was, that's just horrifying. Yep. Well, hopefully we, we will do better, Elliot. No, well, we are, we are doing better. You know, and I really should stay around here because in this little world, <laughs> the people I know are eating this good food. And, uh, and they're intelligent enough to realize that it is making a difference in their health. I mean, we get comments all the time. I talk to the customers, especially now that they have to stand in line a long time because because of COVID, there's only six people at a time in the farm stand. And uh, they know why they're here. Uh, and it, it, it's flavor, but it's also because they understand the quality. And there is a connection between flavor and nutritional value because flavor indicates the food's put together correctly. And that's what you want if you want nutritional value. So one last question, maybe. Sure. Um, and this one's a, a complicated one. Uh, I've, we've talked about it a lot of times. Uh, I want to talk just briefly about scale. Um, obviously, you have chosen Small is Beautiful. And I... I, I... Didn't choose it. <laughs> <laughs> it chose you. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, it's taken so much time and energy to turn two acres of what we started with into land that will grow these amazing crops. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to live long enough to have 20 acres like that uh, on this spot. If I moved somewhere else, that's fine. But to me, the fact that we were able to grow exceptional food on the most unpromising, to begin with, place in the world, uh, the, the world's never going to starve. If we could do it here, you could do it anywhere. Yeah. So it, it, we're, we're on this scale just because uh, uh, of the reality of trying to uh, create more good fertile soil on this particular spot. I, I, I think it's a, a very good scale. Uh, I will even make a value judgment and say I think it's the best scale. But I think that there's farming all over the world of many scales. And I think, uh, I guess my question for you is, can, can it be done correctly on a large scale? Can there be good farming? Yes, yes. Uh, one of the uh, best large-scale organic farms in the world is about an hour west of Heathrow in England. And it's run by an ex-race car driver named Jody Schechter. And the reason it's so good, it's 2,000 acres, is because he has a passion for quality. And it's the passion of the farmer that determines the, the quality of the results. And if uh, everybody on 2,000 or 5,000 acres had the same passion for quality, that uh, Jody Schechter has, you would see uh, exceptional large farms everywhere. And to me, it's just fascinating to see somebody on his 2,000 acres that has this total passion for quality that I have here, and uh, he makes it work uh, on that scale. But it, it's, it's the farmer's mind. Yeah. The farmer's mind and the farmer's footsteps. Yeah. All right, so Elliot Coleman, thank you so much. Thank it's... you for coming by, Dave. This has been great. <laughs> this was wonderful <laughs> to come come and see your farm again. Um, in the age of COVID, I don't get out much, but it was great to come here. Yeah, yeah, well, 
we're going to go inside and eat an exceptional dinner. So <laughs> let's do that. All right, good. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found our podcast. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode eight. Please join us next time for an interview with Real Organic Certified Farmer, Ecologist, Author, and proponent of human-scaled agriculture through market gardening, J.M. Fortier. To find a Real Organic Project farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms, and we'll catch you next time.